At school, reading, writing, arithmetic has a new R, recovery. This facility done right will save lives. A school under construction in Aurora will help kids learn one period and deal with mental health struggles the next. Illnesses fighting the medicine meant to fight them. We learn about a shadow pandemic impacting treatment in Colorado. Your November ballot is getting longer. Another statewide ballot issue got approved today. This one would use tax dollars you already pay for affordable housing. A 100 mile race above 10,000 feet is sure to deprive some runners of oxygen. But no, they're really gonna see llamas. And we're in our seventh year of good news because good news is never old. Next. I've heard about shadow boxing. The term shadow pandemic, that's new to me. The number of times people fall sick with a bug that's resistant to the antibiotics designed to wipe it out. A CU Boulder professor tells our Anusha Roy COVID made that worse, and she set out to add some Colorado context with a look at what's happening inside our hospitals. Dedicating her career to the antibiotic problem, CU Boulder professor Corey Detweiler wants to find a solution. Superbug is a bacterium that well, it could be a fungi as well that is resistant to clinical antibiotics. The more antibiotics are used, the more a collective resistance is built to the meds that we routinely rely on. In 2019, before the pandemic, the CDC says more than 3 million Americans fell sick with this kind of infection and believes things got worse during the pandemic when antibiotics were given to early COVID patients when it wasn't always necessary. But doctors were scrambling to simultaneously learn about and treat COVID fair amount of chaos. To be clear, this is not a blame game. In the years leading up to the pandemic, healthcare professionals were doing a better job of being judicious when they used antibiotics. Fewer people died from these kinds of infections, but things fell apart with COVID. As it kind of had to, given that it was a pandemic and we didn't know what was happening and we didn't know how to treat it. But now we do. And the CDC says these setbacks can and must be temporary. I was a little taken aback. The reality inside Colorado hospitals vary, like at Denver Health, where antibiotic resistant infections are not surging. There tends to be much more drug resistance on the coast. But doctors within the Health One system are seeing an increase matching national trends. The state health department said it's too early to talk statewide trends. I don't know if it's going to be enough, and I'm hoping not, to make a lasting change. Part of the solution lies in the way doctors treat patients. The general trend for most all infections is to be shortening our courses of antibiotics. We continue to learn that we overtreat many infections. Then discovering new antibiotics, which is a slow process for a reason. For um, a lot of larger pharmaceutical companies, my understanding is there's not a great deal of financial incentive for them to develop new antibiotics, right? Um, the, the money is in pharmaceuticals and medications that people need to take for the rest of their lives. Um, you know, your cholesterol lowering drugs, your antihypertensives. You add all that up. We haven't seen a new antibiotic since 1984, according to CU Boulder. CDC and the NIH, they are trying to give incentives and shorter pathways to approval. But Dr. Wiles from Denver Health said they're not really sure exactly how successful it's been yet, Marshall. I think of the times I go to the doctor or don't go to the doctor and don't want to take medicine. Is this where it's like, should I be asking for the antibiotic or should I or if I'm someone who isn't you know, like I like I think my body can handle it myself. Right. What are the doctors suggesting? Right, and so I think they're asking for a little bit of grace and patience from people in the sense that you know, if you need your antibiotics, hundred percent, you need to take them. But. If you have a viral infection, if you've got something that doesn't need to be treated with antibiotics, the doctors are saying, please don't demand it. Don't ask for it. Don't say I have to have it because, you know, that means more people are using it. And then you start building that resistance again. Shadow pain. I'm learning a lot of terms right? in the last couple of years. Thanks, Anusha. Can your Google searches be used to get you charged with a crime? A judge in Denver is going to decide that as lawyers for a suspect in a deadly fire try to get a key piece of evidence thrown out. Five people died in a fire at their home on Truckee Street in Green Valley Ranch in August 2020. Months later, three teenagers were arrested and charged with murder. Police say they found the three teens after serving a search warrant on Google asking for computer addresses of people who search for the Truckee Street address in the two weeks leading up to the fire. In court today, the attorney for one of the teens argued that the search results should not be admitted at trial because the search violated the Fourth Amendment, protection against unreasonable searches and seizures. The judge's decision is expected at the end of October. 
A third statewide ballot issue has qualified for November's election. The Secretary of State, uh, her office today, confirmed that yet another ballot issue, this one for affordable housing, collected enough signatures to be on November's ballot. Which means here on Next, it has now been zero days since we've talked about the November election in August. Now, this would use some of Colorado's income tax revenue to be spent on affordable housing. What does that mean? It would be money spent on buying land that governments could use to build affordable units, money to help renters build equity to buy their home, also money for rental and eviction assistance. The ballot issue will ask voters to set aside up to 0.1% of the income tax revenue for affordable housing. How much would that mean? Next year, an estimated 145 million. The year after that, double that, 290 million. That's part of the same pot of money that helped push the state over the limit, resulting in our Tabor refunds. So if voters approve this measure in November, any money diverted for the affordable housing program would not be counted toward the state's cap, which determines when we reach that limit, which would trigger a Tabor refund. There's no such season as a fire season in Colorado anymore. We know we can have bad fires any time. Forecasters seasonal outlook for the next couple months show the fall could bring more fire danger. Colorado is right in the bullseye of the worst of it, above average temps, below average precipitation, the potential for the same kind of conditions that fueled the Marshall Fire last December. If these forecasts come to fruition, it would mean our third La Nina year in a row. Colorado's state climatologist, Russ Schumacher, says that many back-to-back -back dry falls would be unusual, but no matter how dry we end up being, we're in good shape in comparison to the past. We're coming into the fall with, with much better conditions than we've seen uh, in the last few years coming into the fall. And so I think even if the fall is dry, um, you know, a, a lot of that risk is going to be lower than what we've seen. Here's the caveat. Schumacher says these seasonal forecasts can be tricky to get right. They look at the statistical odds across a whole season, not individual weather events. But a really wet storm here or there, perhaps like we saw earlier in this week, that can do a lot to help our fire danger. Health leaders in Colorado say there is a child mental health crisis. More kids in need of more intensive care with fewer places to get it. The Cherry Creek School District was worried before COVID in 2019 and started plans for its own treatment center. Now the district is a year out from enrolling students. We are losing kids. And if our thinking was that if we could build this and provide our model of education and partner with a powerful clinician group, then we could maybe provide a, uh, a model, not only for school districts in Colorado, but hopefully for school districts around the nation. The district will partner with Children's Hospital Colorado and the CU Department of Psychiatry to open a mental health day treatment center for students. It's under construction right now, as you can see. This is at the district's Joliet campus in Aurora, which is off Havana and Jewel, a little west of Overland High School. It'll be able to take 60 kids at a time, offering individual and group therapy along with learning. The goal is to get kids the care they need in a setting that feels more like normal school. But too often, um, these kinds of treatment uh, settings use nothing more than tends to be babysitting for a little while. We can bring to this program evidence-based, state-of-the-art kinds of treatments that we know are going to be successful and then track and adapt them as needed. This facility is paid for through a bond measure passed by voters in 2020. The school district says the building will be done next June and the first students should be taking classes one year from now. May I make a recommendation? This is part of the newscast where we point to work that isn't ours, but we think you should check it out. What a former Aspen Times editor wrote in The Atlantic seems like a fiction novel. Foreign billionaires, the cousin of a Supreme Court justice, lawsuits, censorship, and journalists prevented from reporting the news. Andrew Travers's article in The Atlantic de details what he describes as the destruction of the 141-year-old Aspen Times. He worked for and briefly led the paper at a time when he says he and his staff were not allowed to report on the eye-popping sale of land in Aspen, land bought by a cousin of Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch for $10 million one year and sold to a foreign billionaire for $76 million the next. His article talks about his new paper's 
if, sorry, his paper's new owner censoring coverage of reporting on that sale and censoring coverage of a subsequent libel lawsuit against the paper. You get one free Atlantic article a month if you're not a subscriber. This one's worth it. We have a link on our next Facebook and Twitter accounts. Every week, we work together to help nonprofits help our neighbors, even when Kyle is off. Here he is with an update on this week's Word of Thanks. Greetings from Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Park. Hey, thank you for your generous support of our Word of Thanks microgiving campaign this week while I have been away. Together with the nonprofits of the Refugee Action Coalition, we're creating the Ma Kang Scholarship Fund. Ma Kang was a beloved advocate for the refugees and immigrants in Denver's East Colfax neighborhood. Last month, she was shot and killed outside of her home. This week, we're raising money for scholarships for driven, talented young people in that community who want to go to school to pursue an education in early childhood ed, nursing, neurosurgery even. The community had gathered enough money for four scholarships. We're going to raise a lot more than that this week together. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303 871 1491 to join me in giving to create the Ma Kang Scholarship Fund. Over 115 weeks, your weekly Word of Thanks microgiving campaigns have raised more than $9.4 million for nonprofits around our state. That is a pretty cool and pretty big thing, even for a state that has a lot of pretty cool and pretty big things. Thank you so much for all your support. Denver's changing streets in a way drivers may not like. They're aggressive, you know, you drive over them and you're like, ooh. A traffic engineer tells us that's the point. At the highest point in a uniquely Colorado race, runners ask, is it the altitude or are those llamas? For some people, like, is this a hallucination? And we'll end our week celebrating your good news on one of our last dog days of summer. Cushions, soft and comfy. I know it's a pillow. Street cushions are not soft, but they are meant to be comfy for cyclists. Instead of the usual big bump in the street, Denver's Department of Transportation wants to add cushions on three streets where the city will place new bikeways. This is a look at a similar setup, which is west of Old Town Arvada. The cushions are basically a bump cut into three with gaps in between. For cyclists, they slow traffic, or they're supposed to, except for that car. Your car will have to slow down approaching them, but bigger, God, nobody is slowing down for those. Bigger emergency vehicles can drive over them without hitting the bumps. The city is planning to add three of them on new bikeways, Perry Street near Sloan Lake, parts of Gallipago in the Baker area, and 25th Avenue northwest of City Park. They're not exactly fun to drive over. A city traffic engineer tells us that's kind of the point. The plan is to make these smaller neighborhood streets more comfortable for cyclists and pedestrians. And if drivers don't want to deal with them, the message is, listen to this, Arvada drivers, head to a main road, not the next street over. That's something that we don't necessarily want to see is traffic diverting to another local street and causing a problem on another local street. The city of Denver does not yet have a timeline for when the speed cushions will be installed. When they do arrive, the city will track traffic on the road to see how well the cushions work. Not for the bikes, but for the vehicles that have to slow down, including emergency vehicles, buses, street sweepers, and snow plows. A decent afternoon out there. Some areas getting scattered showers. We have a live look over downtown Denver where that smoky haze is still hanging around for a little while. We're at 80 degrees. Winds coming in from the east at around 9 miles per hour. Now our temperatures all across the front range in eastern plains. We're seeing a wide range. 62 right now in Colorado Springs where we are seeing some storms. 80 in Denver and then everywhere else kind of falling in between. 50s and 60s in the high country. 63 out west in Grand Junction. So we take a look at our HD Doppler radar and a couple of hot spots seeing those storms. One is going to be further west west along I-70 through the uh, Glenwood Canyon area, so we're going to continue to watch for that. We also have some storms right over Colorado Springs, causing a couple of warnings there. So we have a flash flood watch in effect until 10, and a flood advisory as well as a flash flood warning off to the west. And then right over Colorado Springs, we have a flash flood warning in effect until 845 over El Paso County. The rest of our show is going to the dogs. You happy, boy? Yeah. And the llamas. That the llamas are just, just smarter. Meet the smart, sturdy, and fluffy crew that's 
crucial to a race through Colorado's high country. Next. This weekend, hundreds of runners will race through the mountains around Leadville for the town's infamous 100-mile run. When they're about halfway done, they'll hit the trail's highest point and see something unexpected. Llamas. About two dozen llamas. For 20 years now, race organizers have relied on them to haul supplies up to Hope Pass. The llamas carry 70 pounds each, food, water, and medical equipment. A group of volunteers helped pack them and set up the aid station. We wanted to know, of course, why llamas? Why not other people, horses, burros, or helicopters? The llamas are just, they're just smarter beings. Um, and also, they're very attentive, they're very agile, and they're just good natured, you know, and I think it also over the years has added this amazing layer for the participants. The athletes surprise of seeing llama never get old, according to race director Tamara Jelnick. Neither does a little energy boost from seeing the friendly fuzzy faces, though it might take a minute for them to realize they are not oxygen deprived and just seeing things. For some people, it's like, is this a hallucination? Is this real? What is this? I think animals are kind of one of our most amazing gifts in the world. And that sort of boost in morale is kind of huge right at that point as well. But there is a definite component of hallucination for some folks, I think. The llamas went up today so organizers can set up the aid station. I'm a runner, and getting up early is part of the gig. But boy, this race starts at 4 a.m. tomorrow. That requires an early a llama clock. It's Friday, which means it's time to do Friday things like give awful puns and share your good news. It was such a nice day because it's not 90, so we figured we'd spend it outside. You know, it's awesome today. Weather's gorgeous. It was a nice cool day today, so I brought my dogs to Chatfield. I just feel super fortunate. Just really great to have access to all this beauty. Stay good boy. My good news is that my old poodle was able to get in the car by himself. We'll see how he does on the way home. My good news is I'm here today at the gravel ponds at Chatfield, bringing the paddleboard out just for the second time this summer, actually. Ready? Help us, dog, help! Help, dog, we need help! I'm out help here with dog, a group from High Country Newfoundland Club. Help, dog, help! Come on, buddy, help us! And what we're doing is water rescue training with our Newfoundland dogs. Good boy, come on! It's good news because people don't realize all the fun things you can do with your dogs. You happy boy? Yeah. My name is Mary Krieger, and my good news is that I am about to do a sprint triathlon called Outdoor Divas in Longmont. And the day after the triathlon, I'm going to be turning 50 years old. I'm ready for 50, getting ready to take it on. That's my good news for the day. <laughs> oh, yes, they love it. <laughs> Here's my final message. It doesn't matter how old you are or what shape you're in, you can do this. If you put your mind to it, you can definitely do this. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise because uh, it's inside of you. It's inside of everybody. Good news through the lens of Corky Scholl. Answering a question about the ballot issue that I talked about just a little bit ago, which takes us back to zero minutes since talking about November's election in August. Joe writes in wanting to know if that affordable housing tax question on the ballot triggers a vote. Yes, you'll be voting on it. It's not a tax hike, though. It's using existing income tax revenue and just saying, I want to use it over here. I'll see you on Monday when I have to set my alarm clock again. I'll see myself out.